Welcome back to the Command Your Brand Show. I am your host, Jeremy Ryan Slate, the CEO and co-founder of Command Your Brand. And we help our clients to get out there in the right way and make a big impact. You can grab our new number one PR book on Amazon over at bestpodcastbook.com. Reminder, if you're brand new to this channel, like this video, leave us a comment, and smash that subscribe button if you want to command your brand and make a big impact. Today, I'm really excited because, as you know, the lifeblood of any business is sales. If you're not selling, you're dying. And I am really excited for the guest we have today who he and I were working on his name pronunciation. So if I butcher it, when I when I welcome him to the show, he will definitely correct me. Uh, welcome to the show, Alan Verstig. Excellent. Thanks, Jeremy. Thanks for having me. And uh, a good job of trying to pronounce that difficult surname of Verstig, just like you're clearing your throat. But great to be on the I podcast. I have trouble with the, the guttural <laughs> ending, man. That's what I can't do. That's the hard part. Yeah. <laughs> So, so for people that may not know who you are and, and what you do, Alan, tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do, man. Yeah, at, at a very high level, I mean, we help companies develop sales managers so they can drive results. Um, the reality, Jeremy, is if we go back to the 80s, we had highly effective frontline sales managers and unintentionally technology has removed us from it. But uh, not where I started. The backstory was I studied electronic engineering uh, not my fault. I watched Airwolf, Knight Rider, and MacGyver. So I thought that's what I was going to become. And uh, after two years of cleaning cockroaches out of banking terminals, I decided this isn't for me. And I went into sales. And I'm asking your listeners not to drop off now, but got fired from my first four sales jobs. And the Man. frustration, Jeremy, was I was doing everything they said I should do. They said I needed to know my product and get 100% from my product knowledge test. They said I needed to be more motivated and I was so excited, so excited you could weld with me. So I went from the world's best talking brochure to the world's most excited best talking brochure, but I couldn't succeed. And it became a turning point. You know, when you go from engineering into sales, I lost my dad when I was 12. I had three sisters and a mom. You know, they wanted me to be an engineer. That's what you do if you're from Dutch heritage. That's what we do. <laughs> um, and I was tempted to go back into engineering. But my frustration was... As an engineer by heart, I don't see the world as you're born a salesperson. There's got to be a system. There's got to be cause and effect. And I wanted to understand that. But it was under a great manager that I changed. And he said to me these words, Jeremy said, he's selling a job or a career. And I said, no, it's definitely my career. He said, okay, when did you study for this career? He said, Al, you cannot study for a moment and stick to a lifetime of success in this, this domain. It is a profession and you're always practicing. If you're going to make it a profession, treat it like a profession and start studying. And that's when I really started getting into the neuroscience of persuasion and understanding behavior change and understanding selling and that curious engineering mind, figuring out how we drive change. And eventually we had the license for spin selling um, and great program, but we couldn't get traction. And it was at that moment that I realized that, that that moment of insight from a sales manager was what I wanted to do for the balance of my life. If we can develop effective sales managers, we can change the family trees of the salespeople that they lead. And that's how we came to be. So, so let me ask you this, because as um, the son of an engineer, as the, uh, the, um, my father-in-law is also an engineer, I have a lot of engineers in my life, I guess looking mm -hmm. at that, um, how did that viewpoint affect how you approach sales? Because I, I, I think in actuality, there's a lot of strength there if you know how to channel it the right way. A hundred percent right. I think the challenge is, firstly, we, we are we are loyal to our meaning we give to things. So if I and, and they're not true, they're just our meaning. If I believe that you're 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 you got the gift of the gab and you're a born salesperson, well then I'm going to have a fixed mindset. If you understand Carol Dweck's fixed and growth mindset, I'm going to go. Well, I'm not built for that. But when I have a growth mindset and I say, but wait a minute, right? There's got to be mechanics behind this. And, you know, as engineers, we want to roll up the sleeves and get into the gearbox and go, what, how, what makes this work? And it's that curiosity, that growth mindset that you start to see systems, you start to see predictable patterns, you start to see nuanced differences that get you to succeed. And the data is scary, Jeremy. I mean, most people say, oh, no wonder you're such a good salesperson. You've got such an extroverted gift of the gap. Yet the data is that there's a 0.03 difference between uh, extroverts and introverts succeeding in selling. So it's a BS story that we tell ourselves, or is, you know, someone likes to call it rules, a BS rule we make up. Um, but the engineering curiosity got me to understand those mechanics of what creates high-performing sales cultures through the sales managers. So let me ask you this then. When you look at 
like a process? Like what things should we be looking at in that in that process? I think that for a lot of businesses, that's the major thing that messes them up is they're like, all right, we're going to sell something. They don't know what that process is to actually get somebody from coming in your organization to actually, you know, working with you as, as a client. I guess for, for you guys, what is what does building a process that you can measure and control look like? Yeah, you know, Jeremy, I think it's such a great question, but I'm going to have to take a step back because yeah, the challenge good. many of the times is we build the process without defining the meaning. And I'll give you an, an example of frustration. I'm hearing this thing being bantered around nowadays in our space called human to human selling. I'm like, has everyone been asleep at the wheel? I mean, <laughs> isn't that what selling is? We've been is? doing that for thousands of years. <laughs> exactly. And when you start with a noble purpose, when you start with selling won't help, but helping will sell, when that's your design point as an organization driving sales and saying, it would be negligent for us to deny the world the value of command your brand. So when I'm selling, I'm operating from a higher purpose. I'm going, Alan, if you want to get your voice out into the market, if you really want to present yourself as an expert in your field, you've got to partner with command your brand because you don't know what you don't know, Al. Now, you don't say it to me like that. Your team doesn't say it to me like that. But effectively, they start with that noble purpose. Once that's in place, you have the desire to be the chef. Now you need good ingredients and you need a robust recipe. So now you want to talk about, you know, the, the, the key parts, the, the, the substance of your messaging. You want to speak about how you deliver that process. But Jeremy, ask yourself, why do ent entrepreneurs succeed at selling without training? It's because it's before that. They have a purpose. They have a higher meaning. They have a value proposition they take into the market that they, they stumble through the ingredients and the recipe for a while and eventually get better at it. So I think the key thing where organizations get stuck is they treat this like a rogue production line when there's nothing more human than selling. You know, Dan Pink's, Pink's book, To Sell is Human. There's nothing more human than selling. And what, we try, what we've tried to do is make it a production line. And we've removed the human being from the human doing. So I would start with this. It's got to be human-centered. It's got to be based on noble purpose. And then the rest of it is a bit more malleable to the market because, you know, people say selling isn't rocket science. I'm saying you're damn right. They can land something millions and millions of light years away, 4 point, uh, 0.004 seconds late. You know, that's predictable. <laughs> selling is not predictable. Yeah. You're dealing with humans. You're dealing with them on different days. You're dealing with prejudices. You're dealing with a lot of stuff. It's not predictable. So you have to be able to be true to something bigger than the process, which is the meaning. And I use the term all the time. It is borderline negligent for me to deny the world the value my company brings. And when we operate from that, everything else just becomes mechanics of mastery. But if you don't have that, then they become hindrances to how do we do this like a production line as opposed to how do we establish connections with the people we serve. I want to go back to the beginning because I feel like that's a really, really, really important point that you said. And when I look at, so I've been hosting podcasts for almost 10 years now. I think this is like year nine for me. And early on, I, I had a lot of success booking people that like a lot of other people are like, well, how did you do that? And it's like, well, because I had the belief in what I was doing, right? And I think you approach things differently when you have that belief. And I, I, let, I the thing I want to ask you, and I, I'm trying to figure out how to ask this, is if you look at, I think if you look at a lot of salespeople, you can see ones that are failing that don't believe in what they're selling. And I guess this is a two-part question. Can you fix that if someone doesn't have belief in what they're selling? It is kind of one part of it. And if so, how do you, in, you know, re-enkindle belief, if that makes sense? Because you can also get beat up too, right? Yeah, I mean, Jeremy, you, you, you've, you, you've t picked on a point that could be me on a soapbox for two hours. So let me try and let me get engineering on this. It's yeah. really about four, four C's that operate at levels of complexity. What we tend to see in the sales space is we're trying to teach people competence, right? So let me teach you the competency of being a sales professional. And these things matter, how we present, how we communicate, how we build rapport, these things matter. But our competence is always the outcome of our confidence, right? We get competent by doing. So Jeremy, when you started, you got going because you had a meaning and a mindset that said you're going to do this. You then created a level of momentum where you were signing on people, people didn't know how, and then you turned it into a recipe and a system to help people like me get my voice out into the world. That's the, that's the story. But below that, the confidence came from something. And Jeremy, the confidence is likely to have come from conviction. And that conviction has the, the, the bottom line, the bottom of the iceberg, C, which is clarity. 
You know, the amount of leaders I work with and going, oh, Al, I hear you, but you know, our salespeople don't understand our value proposition. And I'll immediately go, what's your value proposition? And they'll be, um, well, it's kind of, sort of, maybe, okay, great. So how do you get me passionate about something? Yet, when you look at normal human beings, so we have a, a, a supermarket chain here called Woolworths. They're about 30 to 40% more expensive. They're high quality goods. And, you know, if you can afford to shop there, it's great to shop there. But try and tell someone who shops at Woolworths that they shouldn't. And you start a war, right? But no one's ever paid them to defend their brand. Why do they defend their brand? They have conviction based on the clarity of what they believe the value is. So they're confident without any sales skills to sell me on why I should go to Woolworths. But they're not paid. They're not incentivized. They're not given a, a, a trip. It's not a commission problem. You know, we're not coin operated. That's the way the world portrays us, you know, the kind of wolf of Wall Street, let me just get in this for cash. We're not coin operated. We are purpose and meaning operated. Then it works. When we break that system, Jeremy, when we become all about the incentives, all about the commission, all about what I'm going to make, those should be the honey we get from, you know, pollinating the flowers in the world. And that's not the case. So you've hit exactly right, is that you had your success because underlying was clarity of what the value was you're bringing to the market and a conviction that fed your confidence. And then you had success. Now we get into this perpetual mastery cycle where you're going, oh, that worked and that worked, that didn't work, but remember that did work and you keep moving where most people stand still and saying, but I tried that sales technique. Well, that's because you're trying a technique. Before you do that, you have to be married to the value proposition. And Jeremy, here's the challenge we're seeing. Organizations are failing at delivering their value promise. And with sales, he has the hardest thing. It's one of the only jobs where our credibility is held by other people's behavior. So how do we I expect a, a sales team to be engaged? Mm -hmm. I think that's a really, really important point because I just like, once again, I can only really speak from my own experience. But for us, the better our product got and the better our quality got, it got easier to sell it, right? Because it was like, oh, well, this is, of course, it's a great product. And I think that's really important like when you're when you're selling as a business. But I guess the, the thing I'm interested to find out like knowing how important purpose is, should that change the way we're sourcing salespeople, the way we're hiring salespeople? Because maybe like, you know, we should be hiring people that are uh, maybe not a fan of our company, but a fan of like what we're doing. Like they're very interested and have a lot of belief in what we're selling. Do, do you kind of change how you're hiring people in that way? I think it, it it's and it's you got to change how you hire, but you got to change how you manage. So we're seeing this pushback that says, "Yeah, but you know, we we're hiring millennials, and they have this unrealistic expectations." And I'm going, "No, they just want a level of autonomy, purpose, and mastery in the work they do. And unless you can connect them to that, they don't engage. And the reality is, every human wants that. It's just that millennials expect it." Right. So there's a expectation of that. So you've hit it so perfectly well. Are we managing our talent in terms of do I have raving fans inside my sales team? Do I have people that have this conviction that drives them? And then how do I coach and elevate their performance and success? But we tend to think that it's it's just a it's just an art. You're born with it, we hire them, and good salespeople make it happen. But the reality is once you're connected to a purpose, even mediocre people can sell the hell out of anything that they believe in. And I think that's a rethink of the organization. And Jeremy, not to go too far off piece here, but yeah. there's data that supports this. So when they, we, there's a research done by Consolia, um, and what they found was when you ask companies why they don't buy, 90% of the time they don't like the salesperson. And the reasons have nothing to do with competency. They're arrogant. They're overly comp uh, confident. They supply centric. They they don't understand my needs. It's all meaning based things. It's it's all about the, how they show up. It's all about characters. So why aren't we developing character traits? Why do we think we can just build competency? Um, yes. And that's why we work so close with sales managers. Unless I change the person responsible for the sales soil, I'm going to be putting in all the, the right seeds, but they're going to die because the environment is too metric driven, too quarterly driven, and those should be ands. Yes, we have to have those metrics, but they take care of themselves generally when we get those things right, the right characters, the right conviction. Uh, man, then, I, then I've got a sales force, not a sales team. So let me ask you this. So I, I look back to my early 20s and I'm, I know I may not look like it, but I'm actually closing in on 40. Um, and and I, looking at my early 20s, I had stopped teaching around 22 because I was 24 because I was doing it. It wasn't what I thought it was going to be. So I went into selling life insurance 
And I was actually really good at it because I like thought people really needed this. I really wanted to help them. I had the worst sales manager you can ever have at a job. He would line all those insurance people up once a week and scream at us about like why we were costing him his job and why we weren't helping him. And I think that a big part of like good salespeople is also the right kind of management. And I guess to how do, how should we be approaching sales management so we're we're more, we're more successful? Well, I think the, the challenge we have right now, and, and we see this in so many areas of the world, but this overly focused view of just the results at the cost of everything else. And we can cite 50 million books on why this is a problem. But the way I see it is, if I take any organization I work with, Jeremy, and and I say to him, who, who was your top performing sales manager last year? Who, who won sales manager of the year? It's going to be based on one thing, the number. Now, please tell me, if you're operating in a dense territory like New York, how do you, how do I, as Ellen, operating in an area like Utah, outperform you in terms of numbers? I can't. So the reality is you're only measuring one thing, you're only rewarding one thing, it's the numbers. But the job of a sales manager has four pillars. I have to get the number, yes. But I have to do that by executing the strategy through my people, not for my people, to drive customer value. And let's flip that. My job as a sales manager is to drive customer value through my salespeople by executing the strategy so that I can get the number. When organizations only focus on the number, it's when the end runs of the world happen, right? It's when these things occur. So a sales manager has got to be building an environment that says, I nurture my people to create value for customers that align to where we're going as a business so that we get the number. And I can incite data point after data point after data point. I never understand why this common sense is not common practice. Any leader who's done an MBA knows that when you take care of those things, the numbers take care of themselves. But instead, we manipulate Excel spreadsheets. We get become pivot table engineers. We do the things that make us feel in control at the cost of things that actually put us in control. And that's what a good manager is. So for me, the ideal world is when the sales manager of the year is the person who developed their people the most, that allowed them to create massive value for their customers, that was aligned to where we're going as an organization, and I achieved my target. Even if my target in Utah is one-tenth of your, your, your target in New York City, I'm still a great sales manager. So I, let me ask you this, because I know like, Things have changed a lot as, you know, we've went virtual and we've had a lot of businesses. How has this affected, you know, I guess not only how brands are like sourcing teams, but like how selling is happening? Like how is selling changed by like the modes of communication that, that we use changing? The reality is it's we have, in my view, the experience I've seen is we have now accelerated incompetence. And what I mean by that is what's changed is the medium. The medium's changed. So now I don't, you know, and that's great for me. I mean, where do I have the arrogance as a, you know, South African male in the bottom end of Africa to sign global businesses on our program? Now, obviously, that's a conviction story. But before I had to be in territory, COVID was a blessing because now I can land a global client and I never leave, leave the comfort and beauty of Africa, right? But the challenge is what hasn't changed, Jeremy, is how I show up. What hasn't changed is that I have the right meaning and mindset behind what I do, and I have substance in my message. Now that I have substance, I have to change the way I deliver that. So you know on a podcast, there's the audio listeners who want to hear what you have to say in their car or on their commutes, and then you have the YouTube video you know, viewers who, although they're hearing exactly the same thing, they want to see your expressions and my expressions. These are modalities of communication. And I think what happened is most people went into a fear and said, oh, I don't know how to sell to this camera. And the reality is when your mindset's strong, you're saying, wait a minute, my noble purpose hasn't changed. Selling won't help, but helping will sell. How do I adapt to this medium? That's what's happening. And my view, Jeremy, is organizations love to get distracted by wrestling with pigs, right? Where, they, where they're getting dirty and the pig's having fun. This isn't the problem. Selling virtually is not the problem. It's selling that's the problem. If I don't have conviction of my value proposition and you change the medium, I'm stuck because I, I felt it had to be in-person. Now, yes, there's massive benefits to in-person, but there's some upsides to virtual. And we adapt when we have the right growth mindset. 
Does it does it answer the question or is it in the wrong oh, direction? It, it, no, it absolutely does. And as someone that actually owns a pig, they don't like mud as much as people think they do. Um, he's actually <laughs> a very prissy man that tries not to get himself dirty or wet. Um, but I, 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 I guess looking at it then, like how is how is sales management changing as we get closer into the future? Because I think it's it's changed. If you look at now versus the 80s versus the 90s versus the early 2000s, it's changed substantially. How does it change as we're going into the future now? So it's such a powerful question and probably the one, Jeremy, that keep, when I say keeps me up at night, motivates me to continue to figure out how we prepare sales managers. But yeah, is the irony. We were, we were more effective as frontline sales managers in the 80s than what we are now with all the technology tools and methodologies. And it's because we flipped the script. We thought that the mouse could manage the people. We thought that the data could manage the people. These are inputs to management. So what we're seeing now is and really the, the mission we're on, how do we bring that robust foundational sales management back, right? You've got to be doing one-on-one -on -one coaching. You've got to be holding people accountable. You've got to be engaging and motivating the team. You've got to have presence when you're managing and leading people. And how do we now leverage technology? So, you know, how are we leveraging generative, you know, language tools? How are we leveraging our tools? Because what's going to happen, the beauty for salespeople is admin's going to become a lot less. So I love GPT. You know, I'm just going to make admin less. And I, uh, salespeople hate admin too, so I get that. <laughs> yeah, we, we do. We, we, we hate having to audit ourselves. Now the mm -hmm. wonderful thing is specifically in virtual selling, the, the system's auditing me. I get a summary of this call. It gets sent into my CRM system. I can clean it up and I'm done. These are big wins. But the risk is when we, we let the technology become the master, right? And that's the key thing. So I don't think it's this big, massive shift in sales management. We still got to do four things well. We have to get the number by executing the strategy through our people to drive customer value. How does technology and advancement improve how we do that and not become a scapegoat for what we need to do? You know, we keep salespeople on board because their CRM is up to date, yet they yes. haven't hit quota in nine quarters. And if that's one person, it's one thing. When that is 80% of the team, that, my friend, is a sales management issue. <laughs> yes. It's not a technology issue. Well, and, and I'll, I'll say too, just on the, on the admin side of things, I think a lot of people, when you have a salesperson that's doing well, have a tendency to say, great, let's hire a second salesperson. I'm like, let me get them an admin. Let me make them not do that stuff they hate. Because at the same time, you got to look at where your, where your log jams, man. And I think it goes back to what you were saying. They were leveraging technology. Like where are the areas you're slowing down and you can use technology to speed you up? So you're not doing the minutia of things, right? A hundred percent right. I love the way you've put it. So yeah, we're part of the the Dan Sullivan Strategic Coach Program, and he speaks about finding your your unique capability. He calls it the the C's. Then you got the B's, which is the work we do that is meh, it doesn't engage us, but we get through it. And then we got the A's, which really frustrate us. The wonderful thing for me with technology, I'm going. I've got more stuff I can outsource to, of my A's and B's to something else and play in my highest use. And I love your analogy. I mean, you'd be a great sales manager. Before I get salesperson number two, let me get admin person number one. Because yes. when I remove that burden, I externally focus the sales resource on their unique capability. But I'll tell you now, the stats are horrific. Managers are only spending 9% of their time with their frontline salespeople, and salespeople are sending about 73 to 78% of their time internally distracted. That's a big problem because I it's like, massive. and it's, I think just even not looking at sales, I'm a big believer in anything that you're doing in the business, focus on what you're good at, right? Like, like for me, I'm really good at building processes and stuff. Like that's what I'm really good at. So like you got a problem, I'll build you a process and I'll let you do it. Right. Like, but I think too often we try to make people do things that they're not good at and then wonder why their performance is suffering. Right. We got to figure out what are you good at and just let you do that. A hundred percent right. It, it is the mechanism of scale, Jeremy. You got to get people into their highest and best use. You got to get them into the unique capability. And it's probably, Jeremy, that you're not only good at building processes, you're engaged by doing that. Now that task for someone other than you might be like pulling teeth at the dentist, right? What makes a difference is what it means to you. And what we tend to do is instruct people on how they should feel about their work. And we put incentives and engagement and a jukebox in the, in, in the training room. It doesn't fix the problem. The problem is find where people are lit up and unlock that in your team. And that's why something as simple, I mean, what you've said is actually profound advice most people miss. Something as simple as getting an admin person to do the stuff that I don't like to do accelerates my strength. 
But in te- instead what we're trying to do is we're trying to say to the, the, the eagles, listen, yeah, I know you fly well, but the curriculum requires you to climb and walk. So let's just let's just get your climbing and walking sorted because you're really struggling there. And the eagle's like, what? And when they do get better at walking and crawling, I mean, walking and climbing, they get weak at flying. And we do this all the time. We do this with our kids. We do this with our friends. We want the world to be how we are. It's not how it is, Jeremy. And when you find, as a good leader, when you find that mechanism in your team and that strengths on how they fit together, man, you unlock potential. Absolutely. Well, Alan, for people watching, if they want to connect with you, if they want to learn more about what you guys are doing, how is going to be the best way for our listeners to connect with you and follow you? Yeah, the simplest and most memorable one is you just hop over onto salesgrowthmatters.com. There's a free gift there. They can get a white paper on challenges around coaching. They can do their own coaching effectiveness space and then um, have the luxury of having a unique name that is impossible for my podcast hosts to pronounce. But Alan Fistig, V-R-S-T-E-G, um, you put it in, you'll find me on all the socials, on LinkedIn, on podcasts, on anywhere you look. So salesgrowthmatters.com and then just stick in Alan Fistig in, uh, in Google and hopefully most of what you find is um, above the line. <laughs> Very cool. Well, Alan, thank you so much for hanging out with me today, man. Jeremy, thank you so much. Great to be here and great to be working with the team and uh, congratulations on all the work you're doing to get people's voice out into the market. Oh, thank you.